important in what we're looking at because it is, in, it, at the core, uh, Stahl's work is subversive. And this particular film, though it looks like really kind of schmaltzy and silly, and it is, and absurd, it is uh, something that he's saying beneath the surface of that uh, transparency. So what is really transparent uh, is much more complex than at face value, and that's where you have to do your work. That's where you have to try to figure out, well, what is Stahl saying, and what is he protesting against, and what is he trying to teach us and show us? Any thoughts about that? Okay, let me continue. So the film noir aspect of this particular piece is that film noir is generally, because it says noir, it's generally black cinema, right? Dark. And of course, we can say this is a dark film. It is full of light, and it's bright, and it's colorful, which is ironic, because most film noir is all shot in black and white. And it plays with you know those gradations between black and white, because what it's trying to do is really talk about the gray areas, the areas that are not obvious, the areas that are uh, beneath the surface, and play with light and shadow. And all of the secrets, all the repressed stuff that we've been looking at all term, where does it live? It <coughs> lives in the shadows, right? It lives in those um, dark spaces underneath, like where the trolls and the goblins and all the haunted and haunting things um, reside. So, okay, so what's going on here? Well, we have uh, the main character of Ellen Barrett. And what are our feelings about Ellen? Strange. Strange, yeah, she's definitely strange. <coughs> Demented? Mm -hmm. Oh, dramatic, yeah. <laughs> troubled. She's very troubled, very unsettled, yeah, very troubled, very Psycho dramatic. Pardon me? Psychopath. Yeah, she's got a psychotic uh, side to her. Uh, it's interesting, though, because the way in which she's characterized is uh, very masculine, traditionally. I mean, if we were going to look at constructions of identity, we would have to say that she's sort of competitive, like fiercely competitive. I mean, she won't even let a child win in a swimming competition. Um, you know, she gets out of the way, I'm first, I won. She's um, she's not mature. Yeah, I don't think she's emotionally intelligent, particularly, because she suffers so badly from um, sort of obsession and possessiveness, and her relationship to her father is clearly identified as one that's not healthy at all. Uh, so we have a list of all the ways in which we can kind of characterize Ellen, and she is our central narrative vehicle, our central narrative figure, and everybody sort of circulates around her, and to be quite honest, I find most of the other characters rather two-dimensional, they're kind of cardboard, uh, they're not that interesting, in fact, they're fairly boring. She's the most dynamic and sort of dramatic character, as you pointed out, uh, out of all of them. she was the main character? Yeah, and she is the main character, essentially. I mean, the only other character that kind of rivals her and is kind of fun is Vincent Price, who plays her defender and her lawyer. And what's interesting about him is that career-wise, he went on to do all sorts of B-horror films. So he became like this sort of gothic character, the librarian, and uh, covered in cobwebs. And, you know, he was sort of stereotyped later on. He was an excellent actor, and he had lots of really kind of astounding roles in many other pictures, but uh, later on, his career, you could argue it plummeted, but I think it, uh, it, I, I think he did really amazing work even in those kind of B genres and hammer horror type, uh, type pictures. Um, but what I'm really curious about and what's really interesting to me is how does this film fit into our um, thematic? I mean, it seems so far removed from the work that we've been looking at when I mean, we've been looking at really serious things like cultural genocide and indigenous identity. We've been looking at the African American uh, sort of Harlem Renaissance and and uh, you know sort of the origins of African American identity and the way in which that kind of um, post abolition uh, migration across America after um, you know the colonial South disaster. Uh, so all of a sudden we're in this fantasy world, this this complete 
sort of fictional, absurdist reality of these characters who live in what seems to be a kind of dreamscape and not really part of um, the real world, whatever that, that world is, or whatever we can um, kind of make sense of it. And I think what's happening here is that we're shifting from also male characters and male voice and sort of the privileged male view of experience uh, to a kind of um, uh, more, I guess, a, a more subordinate voice of women. Um, because women traditionally, even in, up into the 21st century, they don't really control their own agency often. And what I mean by their own agency is they don't have uh, control over what their role within the larger social fabric um, can be because they are restricted by traditional and conventional views. And Ellen defies the traditional and conventional view and she becomes this sort of totemic femme fatale, this uh, black spider woman, this woman who uh, thwarts uh, masculinity, potentially thwarts um, the, the larger, you know, American ideology of family values, um, and she's predatorial and very haunting kind of figure, and she's repeated many, many, many times. And when we go back to 431 BCE, and we look at the origins of Medea, and we look at the construction of um, uh, women in Colchis and Greek, uh, you know, sensibility. Uh, Medea is an outsider. She is part of that unbelonging as well, because she uh, is a sorceress, number one. So she knows she's skilled in black arts, or you know what we would call earth magic or earth arts, and she uh, can you know help people to do various things that they need. Uh, <coughs> From, uh, from her for you know, childbirthing purposes or if they're suffering from some kind of ailment. She usually has you know, herbal remedies and things of that nature. So her sorcery is twofold. I mean, it's not really evil, but people are afraid of her. She's not, she's barbarian, so she's not really um, from uh, you know, the Greek uh, larger culture. And the Greeks saw women as slaves in their hier hierarchy. But they were treated better than slaves because they were means of reproduction and they housed children and they sort of gave, gave birth to the warriors. So they were, um, and heroes, so they were, you know, taken care of just like their slaves were taken care of and there were like manifestos and ways in which you should take care of your slaves so that they would too um, be kind of, um, I guess, uh, you know, they would, they would work harder, they would be better slaves. <laughs> that's something we can be. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Anyways, uh, you have uh, this kind of woman who doesn't belong. And that's what we're going to come to on, when we do our makeup class. We're going to read the play and we're going to see how she did not, you know, honor is so important to the Greeks. And she said, I've been dishonored and therefore I'm going to act. And she became her own agent. And Euripides writes the play as though she's a liberated woman. But in fact, what he's really revealing to us is that if a woman steps outside of a particular boundary or steps outside of the normative in terms of how she's to behave, women are to be seen and not heard, and she's very vocal, um, then you will um, have potential threat in the culture, a predator. So similar to Ellen, uh, these women are predatorial and they're potential threats to the larger social fabric, which is by and large patriarchal. And that's kind of the view. I mean, that's not to say that if you look at the study of masculinity in these stories, uh, that these characters aren't suffering as well. They, they, certainly male characters have to um, make or reach those cultural constructions as well. But what we're mostly interested in right now is just sort of figuring out, okay, so we have this culture of fear and paranoia. We have this hunt for un-American activities. There's actually a committee in the 1940s that get together through McCarthy and they hunt down the, the witches, so to speak. They hunt down the subversive uh, 
uh, writers and they blacklist them. And the reason they do that is so that uh, they won't have any um, buddy ruffling the feathers of the status quo. And you can see that it's a post-war atmosphere, it's a post-war uh, world, and there's a lot of crisis. I mean, men are coming home, they're wounded, injured, and they're psychologically uh, very damaged. Uh, women have been working and out in the fields, like not the proverbial rural fields, but you know they've been out in the world. Not all women want to go back to their traditional role as mother and child care provider. And if you think about it, women pretty much work 24-7 and it's unpaid labor and I mean it's often by choice and there's nothing wrong with it, but it is a you know, there's no, there's no salary, there's no, it can be considered a type of slave labor, historically. So, having Ellen uh, be this independent, competitive, vocal woman, uh, seen as threat, is kind of ironic, and Stahl is kind of deliberately saying, well, you want us to buy into love, marriage, and family values according to this conservative notion and view. And therefore, you pit Ruth against Ellen, and you make Ellen psychotic. Because no woman that would want to be vocal, that would want to be competitive, that would want to go to work in the real world, so to speak, would um, choose that for herself. She has to be defiant, and she has to be unwell and psychotic. That's, that's sort of the idea that is being espoused, or the idea that's being um, talked about. So what's the point of view? How does the story reveal itself? Well, in all the works that we've looked at, when we have first person narration as a strategy, we know that we're going to get much closer to our subject. We're going to follow behind them as though we're over their shoulder and we're going to come to get to know them in a much more intimate way. And even in film, there's a way in which we have that sort of subjective relationship to the, to the characters. And that's usually done through camera work and through the language of cinematic uh, syntax, really. So you have, for instance, if you have a close-up and you get, okay, I'll, I'll give an example, I guess, of um, what I'm talking about. What do I have here? I have hand cream. So if I, if I have a close-up of the hand cream and I bring the camera in really tight, you're gonna see all the details of that hand cream. You're gonna see uh, whatever it tells you it's gonna do for you. You're gonna see the colors, the, the charm of its composition, whatever is there available to you. And they're coded and symbol, symbolic to the larger weave in the context of how the, the work is edited. If you have a long shot of the same cream, uh, it establishes that there's something in the frame, that there's cream in the frame, but it doesn't tell you all the details. So you're sort of wondering as a, a reader in that triadic author-work-reader relationship, well, what's the value or importance of this cream? Uh, or, wh or what is it even? If we don't even know it's cream, but it's something we need to know because the camera's telling us from a distance that we need to get closer to it. If you have a middle close-up, then you have some information, but not all the information. But then you have to remember also that if you get really close up, you're losing the larger uh, picture. So it's like scrutinizing as well. And when you scrutinize, you can become rather myopic. So in an, any analytical work, we need to be really careful about the assumptions we make. First of all, the author is not the speaker in the work, and I can't emphasize that enough. You can't collapse um, the speaker in a particular work and say that that's the author's view or that the author intended anything. Certainly in certain types of genres you can, but in the genres that we've been looking at, uh, it's been very clear where first person is used, it's used as a deliberate strategy to glean our sympathies. Now in something like Frankenstein, we're using um, epistolary, for example, letter writing, and that's bringing us close because letters are intimate. They're not for everyone's eyes. They're only for the receiver and the sender. And so that's a deliberate strategy on the part of Mary Shelley 
to bring us into the internal kind of consciousness of the characters and the internal workings of their heart and the internal workings of them, their emotions. And it's a deliberate narrative strategy that works on us as readers to um, get us to almost peep, right? We're almost like, let's look uh, inside these people's lives and read their private correspondence. And that makes it all the more titillating. And then when we're titillated, that's like, you know, tickled. Um, then it's really fun because um, you think you know something that the characters don't necessarily even know about themselves, which leads us to omniscient narration. That idea that the author who's controlling the narrative knows everything about what's going on in the story. So then the author is able to manipulate not only what the characters know about each other, but also about what we know about the characters. So if what we know about the characters is more than the characters know about themselves, we often have what we call dramatic irony. So if we know that Justine isn't responsible for the crime, and we know that Frankenstein knows that Justine did not have anything to do with this heinous crime, but he's not telling anybody, the author is letting us know that, but the author is not letting the other characters in the story know that, and that is dramatic irony, and that is really important strategically and narratively because our relationship to the characters alters as a result of what we know and what we don't know. And that really colors how I feel about Dr. Frankenstein because being a noble man and having noble characteristics and traits, just as Ellen does, or many of the characters that are abominable, what makes a villain so compelling is when that villain is somebody that you like. If you didn't like the villain, you wouldn't care about them, and then they wouldn't be all that meaningful, I don't really think. But um, the more you fall in love with a villain, um, and I mean, I don't mean literally in love with them, but you know, you love the, the kind of ways in which they make you think or feel, the more likely you're going to, I think, um, sympathize with some of their behaviors that are less than kind or less than acceptable. And certainly the monster, the fiend, the wretch, the creature, the nameless, unbelonging one, um, he does many things that we would not generally forgive. But in this sense of what he's been through and undergone and gone under, we feel more sorry for him. And we feel less sympathetic, some of us, because I can't speak for all of you, uh, but there's those of us that might feel less sympathetic uh, to Dr. Frankenstein uh, for his secrecy, for his um, ego kind of maniacal ways. I mean, certainly when you see Walton and the crew and you hear Walton's letters to his sister, Elizabeth Sackle, there's moments when I'm reading the letters, and we'll, we'll go to the letters and we'll break <coughs> them down, but there's moments when I'm reading the letters when I really feel the sort of sense of kind of narcissistic drive, I guess, where he's not thinking about anybody else but himself. He's not thinking about his, his crew's family or their health concerns or anything that might um, be humanistic or uh, humane about them. So, so that's, that's something to think about. So in this particular sense, we have point of view uh, and we have different t styles of narration. And if we were to take D.H. Lawrence's thinking and apply it, we would want to trust the tale and not the teller. And that's a very important point that you might want to think about when you're responding in some of your essays uh, and your responses. It's your view, read against a character, read against a plot element, read a moment where you're shocked and stunned at a particular change or shift in the action or uh, what a character does or um, the history or you know some element of surprise that you just didn't anticipate or expect as a reader, you can read your view, but you can read your view by using textual evidence to support that view and narrative devices, one in particular being narration itself. So always you have to think, well, that person, even if they're speaking for the other characters, and they're giving us all different points of view, they're still only giving us the singular point of view of their view of others. 
So it's very myopic. But if you read the story and the elements of the story, then the story tells you things that the narration does not. And that's where Lawrence is saying, trust the tale and not the teller of the tale. And that becomes um, very interesting uh, because of the, the, the teller of the tale, particularly when we get to somebody like Henry James, they're deliberately, in the title of his book, The Turn of the Screw, they're deliberately playing with us. They're putting us in a maze, and they're telling us to go through that maze, and then they're giving us all these little plot shifts and mechanisms to thwart how we think the work is, or if the ghosts are real, or the ghosts aren't real, or you know if what Ellen does is you know um, normal or not normal. You know what, what's going on here? Why are these things happening? And why isn't anybody telling her? And you know it's that. It's all very kind of highly constructed, and that's what makes it so clever and fun. Edgar Allan Poe is a perfect example. When we look at his narrators, they're often mad. They say, I'm mad. If you're insane or you have no reason, and they're telling you to trust them, you would want to think, well, how does that work? That doesn't make sense. You're, you're out of your mind. So anything you tell me will not be very uh, convincing, uh, and yet, his narrators are often extremely convincing. So uh, that's something to think about. So Ellen, uh, Lieber to Heaven opens with Paul Ro Roby, and he's the defense for uh, Richard Harland and Ruth Berent, Ellen's sister. And he talks to us in the past it, from the point of view that he starts in the present. So the narrative opens in the present, and he re, he's going to flash back, which is another narrative strategy, and tell us about the story. And we go into the past, and then we come back to the present. Um, and the present, of course, is that Disney ending where Ruth is waiting in white, highly coded, on the dock, a uh, woman waiting, always a great you know melodramatic moment, all women wait. And, uh, or, you know, in melodramas. Uh, weep and wait, the two W's, WW. So she's not weeping because she's elated because um, we know, or we come to know, that she's always loved Richard um, because she's broken down in the court scene um, in a kind of, you know, almost uh, comical way. I'll replay the, the sequence because it just doesn't even stand up in court. There's you know, there's no legal um, work being done there at all. It's just highly dramatized uh, uh, drama. Uh, yeah, so uh, we, we do have that same narrative structure in Frankenstein, where we end up um, in the past and the story is retold. And in the retelling, uh, we get several views. I think my favorite views are really the monster's views in Frankenstein, because the monster, he asks questions. And whenever you ask questions, you sort of pleading in a, in a really strange way. Even if they're rhetorical, the answers are already contained in the questions. He's saying, if I'm just materials, for example, if I have no soul, if I'm nothing more than materials, then why can I play the flute like this? Where did I learn this? How did I acquire this knowledge? And then when he goes to say to, um, Dr. Frankenstein, when he takes Dr. Frankenstein's bride and he wants the bride for his own, he says, well, they're just materials. And he tries to point out, but yeah, you're so attached to this person, but they're just materials. So then why would it matter? She's gone. It doesn't matter, right? So be very conscientious of not only the genres, because the genres um, are very important to our understanding of how the piece is going to unpack itself. And be very aware of point of view and the different narrators. So what were some of the scenes in Lever to Heaven that were or stood out for you that you would say that you would have a very strong response to, for example? Yes, go ahead. Sorry. There was a scene at the train station, like once they got down, where there was an Aboriginal woman I don't know, she looked like she was like begging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, why did that strike you? Because that is one of this, I've 
I've probably watched this film over the years so many times, and I ever so vaguely, now I have to go back and re-watch, um, remember that it would have been, because it's, um, you know, the southern part of New Mexico, it would be a Mexican woman, and she probably would be a very poor woman, and why would Stahl put her in the picture? Well, there you go, there's the subversive narrative um, that, I, that I'm looking for. He's putting her in there to be read against these people who live in this other, in the in, for contrast. And that's just phenomenal that you that your eye caught that um, because that's social commentary, right? On you know the context of um, the people that are doing much better than the majority of the population. Because when they got back, there wasn't much for anybody to do. They couldn't find work. They were just uh, disenfranchised. Uh, a lot of the men were marginalized, wandering from place to place for day labor. It was a pretty ugly landscape. Uh, so that's that's fantastic. <coughs> yeah. Anybody else? No other scenes struck you as like out there and very. Yeah. Go ahead. There was uh, this like you know where like um, they threw the ashes of the father. Of the father, like, right? The scene is like mountains. Right. <coughs> okay, and here we have another really important aspect of the analytical work that you're being asked to do on your first assignment when we get to it later, which is to look at setting, place, time period, atmosphere, mood, right? Those, those are all literary devices. They're all important. And in melodrama, and in particular in Stahl, he has several locations. All of those locations are elementally driven. So in other words, you have very harsh elemental factors at work. Uh, Back of the Moon is incredibly isolated. It's the deep, dark woods. Uh, you hear the sound of these haunting loons. You see nature at work through Thor, right? Thor is the big nature lumberjack man, which also comments on America and building America as a frontier, which harkens back and kind of gestures to the Western, which is you know something we looked at when we looked at uh, the role or the construction of indigenous identity and the representation of indigenous indigenous identity in um, Neil Diamond's uh, Real Engine, and certainly the Western gave us those distorted views of what. Plains Indians and Native identity is or was. Uh, so you have that. So that's really insightful. You have that landscape, and I, I play that scene over and over again because it's Ellen on a horse, spirited away in her obsessive, most possessive moment of fiery fury. And she's got her father's ashes and she's going from side to side in this absolutely crazy melodramatic way. And why is she doing that? What is what is Stahl telling us about her relationship to the father? Well, they're inseparable because she loves too much and because she towards everybody else's relationships as a result of that kind of drive. And so it amplifies and punctuates the scene uh, to have her against this incredibly sublime backdrop. Why does Frankenstein meet his uh, creature in the Sea of Ice? The Sea of Ice is probably one of the most haunting, isolated, uh, remote places. So remote, sort of equals the mirroring of the inner landscape of the characters themselves. So in this desert, uh, prickly cacti, um, jagged landscape, you have this psychotic, obsessive, possessive, jealous, beautiful, I mean, for her day, she was considered a great beauty, a glamour woman, in the middle of this place, in the sort of twilight of evening, on a horse with this crescendoing soundtrack that's absolutely out of place and absurd, why do we have that? 
because I just said it mirrors, it creates tense tensions, right? That's an atmosphere. The atmosphere is tense. Everyone's so tense in that movie. Everybody's like a piece of cardboard that just doesn't bend or something, you know? And they're wooden. And so it's this tension that's created. So you have this atmosphere that's, you know, very sinister and very dark and it's, you know, um, tense. And what else can we say about it? Gloomy. Gloomy. Well, in that scene, I thought it felt like that uh, she was angry at the fact that uh, her father left, her, that she lost her father and she was throwing it away with anger. Yeah, there, well, there seems to be a lot of unresolved uh, uh, issues. Yeah, issues there. And I think he wants us to know that she's not completely well adjusted. Because right. <laughs> you know? she's out there for a while. Right. So it establishes a lot about her character yeah. because it's really the beginning of the film, right? We know there's something off about her from the beginning. And she's staring at him. And how does, how does he manage to make us feel that there's something not right about her from the very beginning of the film? She was staring at the at uh, Richard, and then when he asked her, and she said that she, he looks like her, his fa her father. The way she was looking at, uh, at Richard. Okay, so can you describe the way she's looking at him? She was staring as if, I mean, her father reincarnated. As though what, sorry? As though she saw a ghost. No. But then she was smiling. She was, she no, no, it, she literally thinks yeah. she sees her father. Yeah, yeah, she was smiling, so, but it was creepy to a person who would stare at them. Okay, so we've, it's, it's creepy, but we don't know why because we have no information. And what you said, she's staring. Yeah. So people don't stare, right? When you're, it's a modern experience, when you get on public transport, or even though we're so close together and crowded together, when you get on the bus, right? And you get on the bus and, you know, I've got my book or whatever and I get on the bus and I go to sit down. You know, I'm sort of more looking down, right? I'm looking, you know, over to the side. I'm looking at my watch. Um, I'm reading a book. But I'm not sitting there going like this, right? <laughs> going, looking at you going. <laughs> and I don't actually bend over and look more deeply at you. No, I look away. And I, I don't know if that's even normal either to look away. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, why do we do that? We're afraid to look at each other, but to stare at each other just seems really out of, you know, breaking because boundaries. You feel insecure the person could do anything, they could attack you. Or well, why would we feel that people are gonna attack us? Well, he could be a psycho, but only a psychopath could do like that. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, is that we're just all human beings. Right? But she's a psychopath. <laughs> well, she has a psychotic side to her, that's for certain. I mean, what are the things, okay, so to get back to what we're writing about today in our responses, um, having circuitously and labyrinthinely, whatever, that's a word, um, uh, I didn't spit it out very well, but we're, we're wanting to get to, what's my question here? What do you think Stahl is saying subversively, subversively about women through Ellen? Okay, so we haven't talked about Ruth, which is a deliberate construct, right? And we haven't talked about Danny and the drowning. And we haven't talked about Ellen killing her first, or her only child. And we 